Then our next speaker will be Dr. Campbell. And she is a doctor of management, world-class millennial global leader, multi-passionate entrepreneur, academic practitioner, international speaker, and mentor. Formerly a cross-cultural organizational communication specialist, she now serves clients in the capacity of the digital organization development and millennial leadership specialist, helping them to maximize their online present and presence and engagement. And in the world of academia, Dr. Campbell is a module convener and senior lecturer at Dongbei University of Finance and Economics in Dalian, China. She is currently developing a leadership coaching program with the university to help students discover how to effectively mitigate the transit, uh, transitional challenges of online higher education. Dr. Campbell's background is extensive in working with nonprofit and for-profit organizations in creative media and teaching courses, such as English for specific purposes, business English, business ethics, and cross-cultural communication. So I'll just hand it over now to Dr. Campbell. Excellent job, Christine. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. It's almost as I wrote it myself. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Thank you so much for tuning into this presentation specifically. Uh, we are going to be talking tonight about enriching student online learning experiences through virtual engagement practices. And so just to give you an idea of what this presentation will entail, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is the response to e-learning, how my students in particular responded to e-learning and the change that happened last year as a result of the pandemic. Then after that, I'm going to talk to you about self as instrument, understanding my own biases about online higher education, and then my personal virtual learning engagement practices, some ways that I keep my students engaged during our online learning sessions together. And then lastly, we're gonna end with a breakout brainstorming session where you guys are gonna get to have a nice little group activity in breakout rooms. So first things first, um, I found this quote online that really, I felt like really resonated with us as, um, as academic professionals who are teaching online. And this is by Dr. Christine Greenhow, Associate Professor of Educational Psychology and Educational Technology at Michigan State University in the United States of America. And the quote says, when online learning is well designed, it can be as good or even better than in-person classroom learning for students who have the requisite instructional supports. Frequent, direct, and meaningful interaction that combines synchronous and asynchronous instruction is essential to whether students succeed or struggle with online education. Research has shown that through ubiquitous technologies like social media, teachers can enhance interactions between students, between students and teachers, and with people and resources outside the classroom. All are important for a student's sense of belonging in an educational community. And I felt like this, uh, this quote was exactly my sentiments. It, it, they were my exact sentiments about how to get students to be more engaged and to have a better response um, instead of fearing online education and embracing it. So what led me to present this topic? First of all, uh, my students, like many of you last year, uh, was hit with the unexpected, um, as well as we were. Um, they, in the spring semester of 2020, um, most of them at this time, they were at home during Chinese New Year. And here we were all in different places around the world, not able to come back to campus for our traditional learning experience. And so of course, the first thing is resistance to change. Uh, the first semester was very, very hard on our students. Um, most of them, like I said, they were not on campus. And as a result of that, I had to take into consideration my students in their own homes. I had to ask myself, you know, if they weren't turning in their homework on time or if they had um, issues accessing resources, I had to ask myself, are there internet connectivity issues? 
not just thinking, oh, this student is lazy, they're not doing it. There could be other factors at play. And then also too, because students were not physically on campus, there was a lack of motivation due to their environment. I don't know about many of your students, but when our students are on campus, uh, especially in the classroom, they are more motivated to do what they're supposed to do, learn in class, participate and engage. But when you're at home, even for me, when I'm at home, sometimes I have to get myself together because my environment, unless I have made it conducive for learning and teaching online, I'm going to be extremely relaxed, extremely comfortable, and I may not have the same level of motivation um, to engage or to interact or even to learn as I would if I was physically in the classroom. So I had to communicate with my students in the beginning to find out where they were, how they were feeling. And so I used polls to gauge progress. Now, when we first started in the spring of 2020, um, our virtual learning system that we had uh, was all in Chinese. So that didn't really work for me because I can't read Chinese um, and I can only speak it ED Indian. I mean, it's really, really bad. I, I sound like a toddler when I'm speaking Chinese. And so I had to find another, uh, another way to be able to communicate with my students and also hold lessons. And so once we, the teachers, we got the go ahead to use alternative avenues or methods, um, tools to be able to host our classes asynchronously. We didn't do it um, synchronously at first. Um, I used a program called Edmodo. It was free, it was online, and the students did not need to have VPN to access it. So you can see from some of the screenshots here, um, the first thing that I did was I asked the students how they want it to be taught. I did that. I asked the students, hey, which do you prefer for the rest of the semester, live classes or pre-recorded class videos that you can watch on your own time? And if you look here, 78% of students said pre-recorded classes. They wanted pre-recorded video lessons that they could watch on their own time. And then 22% said live classes. Now I had 205 students that semester, only 188 actually logged in to access and, um, and respond. And you can see here that there's a little bit of engagement. You have 23 likes from students who see the post and they're like, like, let me respond. And over the semester, I continued to ask them questions, but I felt like after I, I discovered their way that they wanted to be taught, now I needed to check on their mental health. I needed to check on their wellness. So I did a wellness check for the next post. And I said, how are you feeling today? And I gave them four options to choose from. I'm great. I'm okay. I'm meh. And in, for Chinese, meh is like just a so-so, right? And I'm struggling. And 51% 51 51 of the students said, hey, I'm great. 40% said, I'm okay. 5% said, just a so-so. And then 4% said, I'm struggling. And looking at those 4%, the students who were struggling, that allowed me to be able to communicate with them, contact them, reach out to them and say, what's going on? How can we help? And most of it was just trying to adapt to learning online. It was very, very, very tough for my students. And then as we continued on throughout the semester, I noticed that there were some students who had difficulty accessing resources. So I wanted to know if all the students were having the same problem. So I did another poll and I asked, I said, no, first of all, students, you do not need a VPN to watch the video from today. And the article is from BBC in the UK. So I wanted to know, can you access the resources? So I gave them options to choose from and they did that. And then closer towards the end of the term, um, this was before we started using Ding Talk for, for classes, closer towards the end of the term, I wanted to know if students were familiar with the Ding Talk app and if they used it. So I held another poll and it was very simple. Hi students, have you used Ding Talk in another DP class? And I gave them five options. One was yes, but only once. Yes, multiple times a week. I'm a Ding Talk expert. I know what Ding Talk is, but do not use it for any classes. And Ding Talk, Shema, that means like, what? What is Ding Talk? And so 31% said yes, but only once. 
34% said yes multiple times a week. And that let me know that other teachers were also using Ding Talk. And if that was working for them, then maybe it could work for me as well. Ding Talk expert, not a person. Not one Ding Talk expert among the bunch. 31% uh, said they know what Ding Talk is, but they didn't use it for any classes. So that also let me know that they had the app, but maybe they used it for all uh, for other purposes. And then there were 4% who had no idea what I was talking about. No idea about Ding Talk. So I was able to use polls to start with my students to, to basically kind of figure out um, what would be the best ways to kind of uh, interact with them. And as you could tell, you see from the likes, like the likes started to grow over the course of the semester because they were beginning to uh, become used to my, my style of interaction with them. But before I could develop these virtual learning um, engagement practices, I really needed to check myself first as a teacher. And in the world of organization development and change, which is my background, we have a, there's a concept that's called self as instrument. And basically with the self as instrument, we choose to use our skills and our abilities to in thoughtful ways to become change agents. And so if I know that my students are already struggling or they are afraid or they are resistant to learning online um, as opposed to being in the classroom, then how can I bring my A game? How can I bring my absolute best to them so that they would be able to in return, bring their best to me? As a teacher, I firmly believe that you have to be the first participant. You have to be the example. And so I needed to understand my own biases and feelings about e-learning and e-teaching. I needed to know, I needed to be very honest with myself about that. And in my background, I actually, my, my master's program was completely online. Um, it was uh, in new media journalism. It was my very first time ever having a full program online. Um, and it was, it was very, very taxing. I'm not even going to lie to you. It was very taxing uh, because it was as if everything that we would do in class was doubled in effort online. Um, we had discussion board posts that we needed to show up for and we needed to respond to peers. And then we also needed to watch the discussion board in case peers responded or asked the question back, then we would need to respond to them. Um, our, we had weekly live lessons from our teachers. And then we also had all of our research and reports that were due every single week. So we had a lot to do, nothing was lacking. And I had to think about how my experience was as an e-learner for for that, even in my doctoral program, it was a hybrid program. So every quarter, I spent a week residency on campus. And then throughout the rest of the term, my classes would be online, almost very similar to what my, uh, to what my master's program was in, except for I also had to meet with my dissertation chair. I had to meet with committees. I had to meet with group members. So it was very, very hands-on. Um, and it was also intense. I had no personal life. Anytime anyone asked me about my about my years in, in higher education, I said I had no personal life whatsoever. But so I took my experience as an e-learner. And then I also took my experience as an e-teacher. I taught for Southern New Hampshire University in their communications department for two years, completely online. And I remembered how my students, um, my first year, it it was terrible. My first year was terrible because my students, um, they, they, they thought that I didn't communicate enough. But I was taking my experience as an e-learner. I didn't like when my teacher was communicating so much with me. So I dialed it down in my first year. But then I realized it's not based on my preferences as an e-learner. Now I'm a teacher. So I have to do based on what is best for the student. So my next year, I picked it up and I started communicating a bit more. And it helped me to understand what my educational values are. And when you are, when you are beginning to create a, um, a engagement practices rule book for yourself, for your classes, it is absolutely important to ask yourself, what do I value most in education? And my very first one, number one is communication. And it could be because my background is also in communication, but still. Very first one, number one is communication. Over communication 
is preferable to under communication. If there's ever radio silence between you and your students, believe me, someone, someone higher up is going to find out. They're going to know, and there's going to be a lot of complaints because students are going to feel like they're lost. There's no direction, there's no guidance. And so making sure you communicate until you find that sweet spot where you're like, oh, this is just the right amount of communication. Over communication would be better than under communication. My second value was creativity. How can I positively challenge my students to think creatively and apply digitally acculturated practices to e-learning? Now, first, I want to address the, the um, how they think creatively, because especially when you're teaching Chinese students um, in higher education, you know, the first 12 years of their education, they're not taught to think critically. They are taught to, to memorize standardized answers so that they can pass the Gaokao. That's the most important thing. And so having to think critically and having to you know, be creative, that's not, something, that's not something that they are taught to do. And so when they get into our classes, um, not just at Dufy, I mean all of us participants, when they get into our classes um, with Western instructors and we are trying to get them to engage and participate, sometimes in the beginning it's a shock. Some welcome it with excitement and others are just like, I don't, I don't really know if I want to say anything because I don't want to lose face, which brings me into confidence. Confidence is the third one. Um, a lot of our students, they are shy and timid to answer in class. They're very shy and timid to answer in class because they are afraid of being embarrassed by getting the answer wrong. This is what we call in, in Chinese culture as losing face, right? So um, building their confidence by praising them openly for answers they get correctly and also for attempted answers. So even when my students get answers in wrong and it's like just so far off, you have to find you have to find the positive in that to give them praise and say, you know, that was a very good try. It's not the right answer, but it is a good try. And I appreciate your efforts. Who else in class can help so-and-so with the correct answer? And that helps them to be motivated to participate more. Now, this is actually in traditional classroom as well as online. Okay. This is, this is how I do for both. And so, um, Going back to, excuse me, going back to digitally acculturated practices. Um, this is talking about social media. Um, you know, we have Weixin, Weibo, we have uh, Douyin, we have so many other things the same way that they would feel comfortable engaging in these social platforms online should be the same way that we allow them to use that creativity in the classroom. Like how can you take the same type of engagement that you have socially online and apply that educationally. So that's that's digitally acculturated, which we'll get into that a bit more. Then discovery. The fourth value for me was discovery. How can I help students discover simple ways to break down barriers of e-learning? Simple ways. It doesn't have to be, you know, something that is super hard or difficult. What challenges do you have and what are some simple ways that we can overcome them? And then lastly, flexibility, which I, I believe um, Dr. Xiao Xiao was talking about when, when she said uh, tailor teaching methods for maximum uh, for the students. Tailor the, the teaching method for the students engagement was, was what I wrote down. <laughs> but, um, but being flexible with e-learning strategies to find that sweet spot. I am a firm believer that even as a teacher, you know, we are seen as experts, but instead of being an expert, how about be an explorer sometimes? Students look to us to find the best ways for them to learn. But I have learned that it is not one size fit all when it comes to education. Sometimes what uh, the, the teaching strategies or even the study uh, habits of one student would be completely unsuccessful for another student. So instead of just telling the student, this is exactly what you should do, this is going to be the best bet for you. This is what's going to help you to, you know, in, they always want to know what can I do to increase my score? You know, this is what's going to be best for you. Ask them a question. Well, what's the best way that you like to learn? It's going to give them because they're coming to you because they just, they simply want you to tell them what to do. But 
it's I found that it is just best because it gets their wheels turning. It helps them to start thinking critically. Oh, well, what ways do I like reading? You know, what ways do I like in writing? What, what do I like best when it comes to public speaking or even trying to learn how to be a better speaker in public? So just the whole discovery and flexibility, taking on the approach of being an explorer when it comes uh, to helping students discover what's best for them instead of always being the expert. Now, there are times when, of course, we have to put on our expert hat as teachers, but I find that sometimes we leave that on so much that we forget to explore with our students to help them find what's best for them. So after I considered what my values, what my educational values are, what I appreciate the most, then I could develop my personal virtual learning engagement practices, okay? And so uh, I had two requirements for myself. I said, Charity, whatever you do, always make sure that it is inclusive, meaning no student left behind. Everyone feels that they are, they can easily do this. And then also make sure it's interactive. I check for pulses in class. Even though, you know, we're online, I check for pulses. If I see students looking like they're falling over asleep, you know, or they're tired or their head is down because they're, they're literally on their phone like this, okay, you're going to get a text message from me. <laughs> You're going to get a text message from me with an emoji side eyeing you telling you to pay attention in class. That's what we do. And so I had to take I had to take these two requirements, inclusive and interactive, and say, how can I make this super simple yet creative? And I know simplicity and creativity sometimes seem like antonyms, but they can go together. I had to look at um, current virtual engagement practices online social media, social networks, um, online forums, chat groups, video conferencing. And then I needed to look at our traditional classroom activities, how students volunteer in class, doing group work, real-time feedback, giving praise for taking an initiative and interacting, and also the ability to build rapport with students. So for me, my perfect scenario would be to take the current virtual engagement practices and the traditional classroom activities and marry them together to create a hybrid of the two methods. And that would entail me combining traditional classroom activities with the current virtual engagement practices to create an easily adaptable experience for my students. So what are some current virtual engagement practices? We see them every day. Well, if, if you're online, <laughs> you see them every day, primarily social media posts, you know, typing, it could just be words, it could be a video, it could be anything that you want, but you're sharing social media posts. The second one is online chat forums, um, going to, uh, you know, different apps where, like Reddit, oh, you could just get lost in Reddit, um, online chat forums, discussion threads, right? Video calls, video conferencing, that's another one. FaceTiming, that's virtual. You know, I'm not there with you physically in person, but here's my phone, there you are. We're virtually engaging with each other. Um, also record voice notes and memos. WeChat, hold to talk. You talk, that's it. You're not showing your face or anything. You send the message. Now we're having a conversation back and forth and you're not physically there in the room. That's virtual engagement. Also the use of emojis memes and gifts. I do this all the time because sometimes you can really just express yourself with an emoji perfectly. Okay. My students have found that out from me. I can just express myself with an emoji, a, a meme or a gift. It's just getting creative with it. Right. And then the very last one is sharing findings through reposting. You found a video on Yuku, you found, you know, an article on Weibo, or you found an article, um, somewhere that you really enjoy and you decide that you want to share it yourself as a social media post someone sees it they like it or respond however they want to and then they leave a comment and now you're having a conversation all of this and it's not in person all of these are current virtual engagement practices so i thought about those six avenues and then i took a look at traditional classroom activities three types of classroom activities. We have didactic uh, learning, active learning, and collaborative. Didactic is what I'm doing now. It's very passive. It's more efficient. You know, we're having a group full of people, a room full of people, and I'm just lecturing. I'm just talking. 
very traditional method of teaching um, as opposed to active where it does require the student to work independently. Um, they get to practice skills and apply knowledge. And then of course, collaborative, which is what we do try to push students to do a little bit more um, because it fosters teamwork. And it also helps to promote positive interdependence on peers. Now, of course, there are advantages and disadvantages to both of these kinds. Um, some examples of this didactic is reading assignments, PPTs, showing PowerPoints, giving lectures. Um, for active is playing games in class, research problem solving activities. Um, collaborative, you have group project discussions and role playing. But the advantages of this is that for the students with didactic learning, it gives them a mental break. They don't really have to think too much. They don't have to do anything. They just sit back, relax, and they listen to the lecture. It's also very familiar to students, especially in higher education. And this is actually the learning activity um, that is most comfortable for faculty because all you have to do is prepare your lesson, put it on the PPT, put it together, you give your lecture, and that's it. You can take you know questions at the end of class if that's what you choose to do. Um, active advantages are that it promotes better retention of learning because it, it helps to engage the student more. And it also may address a greater variety of learning styles. And then for collaborative, of course, it incorporates a variety of skills and perspectives. Um, it helps to develop teamwork skills. Um, and also too, it can reduce the workload for you as a teacher in how you assess the student's work. But then, of course, for every positive, there's a negative. So for didactic disadvantages, this type of learning style is often perceived as boring. Boring. Some of you may be bored right now. It's super early in the morning, and I am didactically talking to you nonstop. You might be bored, OK? I would be too. I promise you I would, OK? It's, it may also be viewed as irrelevant by students because they may go home and forget everything you just talked about in class, everything. So it could be irrelevant. Um, some disadvantages of active is that it often requires more time to prepare the lesson for you because you have to also include time for um, student activities. You also have to think creatively like, well, what if we have questions here? We, have, we need to stop and maybe address the questions or problem solve or whatever. You have to plan for the unexpected. And then, it's also less efficient than didactic because you have to spend more time incorporating other participants instead of you just talking. And then the disadvantages of collaborative is that sometimes it may be difficult for us as teachers to fairly assess students' efforts because it's group work. So how do we know which student contributed, you know, 50% of the project and another one only 5% and then, you know, going around the rest of the room? How do we know who did what? And also it requires students to take on responsibility that they may not be ready for. So my idea was to take current virtual engagement practices and traditional classroom activities and put them together and see what type of engagement I would get from my students. And my result, my result was very interesting. Okay, so just, you know, the same way that I got on and I greeted all of you, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I did that every single class, regardless of how I felt. When I am physically in the classroom, I do that every single class. My students, it's, it's like a thing with us. Like I come in and I say, good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day. Well, being virtual, I wasn't walking into a classroom saying that, so I had to do it online. And if you notice, students also started to say hello because I would, I would say to them, good morning, everyone. Make sure you say hello to me in the chat. And you know, so here they're saying hi, hello. Um, some of them started responding with emojis. I set the pace in the beginning of the semester so that students would know how to follow. And so some of my classes, some of my, uh, my classes, I would just make sure that my PowerPoint presentations were visually pleasing. Um, I provided a, a PPT and a, a PDF for them as well. And then my online presence was just as if I was on social media. Now, for some of you, I know you're like, I don't do social media. I understand. I'm just telling you what works 
for me. Okay. So my online presence te presence technique, you know, I didn't copy and paste a whole lecture and post it because no one's going to read that. No one. I wouldn't even read it myself. No one is going to read that. So pick and choose the best parts, the most important, and then post that. And then also you can see my use of emojis, my use of memes, things that would catch the student's eye. If I can catch their attention, my content should be good enough to keep their attention. And so I had to catch their attention, emojis, saying hello, little pretty pictures and things like that. And you could also tell from the engagement on this post, now this post was uh, was important for them. It was about one of their assessments um, and, and how to complete the discussion board. And so we had likes, we have more engagement, um, use of online articles, sharing that as well. These are all student interaction. And then now this is in the spring semester. This is before I started using Ding Talk. Class participation, these are not my posts. These are students' discussion board posts and responses. These are students typing, writing, sharing articles. I mean, I was blown away by some of, some of the things that they wrote. And then I also, I praise students myself, but then I also, I was excited when students didn't do the, the typical agree with another student. There's one student in particular, or actually two, where they disagreed. I said, yes, a disagreement. Instead of saying, I agree with you, here we have students that say, I'm not, I'm not sure that I agree with you. You know, I disagree. And I was very proud of that. I was very, very proud of that. But here we have, you know, they're communicating, going back and forth, and it was great. So then the next semester, I started using Ding Talk because it was, it was easier. I didn't need to use a, a VPN, even though I, you know, I was in the States, I didn't need to use anything. It was very easy for me to use and easy for my students to use. So I would ask them a question and they would give answers. They would give answers. They would just respond and give answers. Now, sometimes you may have to wait, you know, give, give it a few minutes before the answers start rolling in. Um, but it's the same way as if we were in class physically. You ask a question and students have to think about it for a moment and then they respond. Well, that's what I did. But while I was waiting, while I was waiting for their responses, I made sure that I used multiple devices. So I was teaching on my computer. Um, and before I got my computer, I was teaching on my iPad. And this is an actual real time video of a class when I was doing it. Um, I was teaching and dictating what I wanted to say on the mobile phone. So I said, which medium would be best used for communicating a memo? And here we have students, they're, they're, they're putting the answer. Some I just told them to put a letter the, for the correct one. And here we have telephone. I'm typing that in, which one do we use for telephone? And they're responding. And for the students who got, now most of the answers were correct, but then there were some where the answers were not correct in this case. And there was, for this example in particular, S or V was the correct answer. And you'll see that I praised the student through the use of an emoji in a response. And now another student is going to do the same for following suit. So this was just part of you know, the engagement activities that we had in class. And then there was another type where it's pronunciation. Now, for some of you, you're like, well, how can you do pronunciation exercises in class if it's all online? Remember, one of the means of virtual engagement is voice memo. And so with that, with the Ding Talk app, and you could even do this with WeChat as well, using voice memo. Pronunciation, uh, here's a snippet of pronunciation practice with some of my students. <laughs> Using the voice feature in the APT, you're going to say the following words, byte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, accessory. And some students? Marvelous. Marvelous. Byte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, accessory. Byte, megabyte. And it continues to go on. Megabyte, 
Every single student had to do this. For whatever exercise we did, every single student had to submit their response. Um, and I, one of the things I told them in class, I said, I know most teachers will tell you to not use your phone. However, in my class, it's going to be a requirement. You will absolutely need to use your phone for class participation. And they did well, they did well. Even um, for some of the groups that we had, uh, because I believe this was one of the questions last week about how to do uh, breakout rooms on Ding Talk. Uh, we had TAs, we had teacher's assistants uh, working with us. And so on my roster, on my roster, I would go through like a lottery and pick out four to five students that would also be the, um, the, the students who would be working together in their group projects for their final assessment. That would be their breakout group. So we had the full class group, just like here on Ding Talk. And then each group had a separate group. Now, yes, I ended up having like 5,000 Ding Talk chats that I was a part of each semester, but, <laughs> but it was also, it was nice because students felt closer um, to be able to interact with each other instead of having to do it in, a, in the full class chat. So that was another thing. Okay, so before we do breakout, we have participant practice. And these are the questions that I really want you to think about and reflect before we do the activity. First, think about your current feelings towards e-teaching. And you have to be completely honest with yourself, okay, about this. You have to be completely honest. And the five questions I want you to ask and answer yourself is, are you overwhelmed with the amount of work? And the reason why I say that is because teaching online is more work than teaching in person. Uh, because I don't know if it's, maybe not for you, but for me, it's like I am making up, I'm overcompensating for the lack of physical presence in the classroom. So in my, you know, in my posts or in my, um, in my communication, my exercises, um, when I'm doing my online lesson, I have to make sure that my students feel my presence and not my absence. So ask yourself, are you overwhelmed with the amount of work? The next question is, do you feel that it's easier to teach in person? Some people do. I'm one of those people. <laughs> Some people feel that it's easier to teach in person. And then does this sentiment show in your lectures? However you feel when you are teaching is definitely going to emanate to your students. Your students will feel that. If you are bringing your excitement, they're going to feel it. If you are tired, they're going to feel it, okay? And then also, how is your body language when you're teaching? I have to correct myself because I remember specifically one time I was so tired. I was so tired from teaching that I was leaned over like this and I had to catch myself. You cannot teach like that. What is wrong with you? What is your body language communicating to your students when you're teaching? Or do you just not have your face showing at all? Do you only have a PPT? You should show your face. You should show your face. And, and I was sharing this uh, presentation with uh, a colleague of mine earlier. And she said, well, how do you overcome the, the fear of being online, of being you know, on camera? Because I just like to teach with my PPT and not show my face. I don't have that confidence level to, to be on camera all the time. And I said, it, does, it takes practice, but it's one of the things that, you know, Find a way to overcome it by, you know, just make mistakes. Like what's the thing that causes you to be embarrassed by, you know, about being on camera? Because our students are on camera. They probably don't want to be on camera. So some, so some, so some stepping outside of our comfort zone. Uh, sometimes it does take us uh, stepping outside of our comfort zone to be able to, uh, to do what's best for our students. Okay. And then Sorry, my camera just disconnected. <laughs> and then, are you aware of yourself as an instrument in your e-learning environment? Ask yourself that. Are you aware of yourself as an instrument in your e-learning environment? So, we are going to, I'm going to give you some breakout rooms, if I still have it. Um, and in randomized groups, okay, in randomized groups, 
You're going to take about 10 minutes to think of at least two to three in-person classroom activities that you can transform into e-learning activities. Okay, just two to three. You don't have to do a lot, just two to three in-person classroom activities that you already do that you can transform into e-learning activities and discuss how to use them to enrich your students' e-learning experience. And then when we come back, I am gonna pop in to, to see how you all are doing. And then when we come back, choose one representative to share your ideas afterwards, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and put you into groups. Uh, how many breakout rooms can we do? We have what, 10 people? Okay, let's do four. And you'll be assigned and I'm gonna pop in to see how you all are doing, okay? I think my microphone is fixed now. Melanie, I think my microphone is fixed. Let's see if my camera is fixed. Ah, thank Good. You. There we go. <laughs> now I'm back. Okay, let me go back. Up. I am, um, is it just us? I think uh, I'm unassigned. I have to, I'm just going to join a random room. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for your talk so far. Um, I'm really enjoying it. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'm going to pop in, see who's there. Um, how do I go in? How do I go in? Do Hi again. So I got kicked out of Zoom and um, oh, now okay. joined back in. So I don't think I'm, could you, oh, I'm co-host. Oh, good. Okay. So I can just, <laughs> I will not just join uh, a breakout room where maybe there's not that many people. Okay. Cool. Okay, Thank no you. Problem. Yeah, you're welcome.
All right, as we get everyone to return, I can't wait to hear your ideas and your thoughts. This should be interesting. Good. I think you wrote something in the chat, right? But I can't see it anymore. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was basically reminding everyone to make sure that they chose one representative uh, from each group to share their ideas. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah. I, I was wondering, I was like, did I go over 10 minutes? I mean, everybody is still really like, <laughs> everybody is so, so much into the conversation. So I was like, go ahead. <laughs> okay. That's magic. So, uh, One, two, three, you're back in the room. <laughs> like that, magic. Everyone appeared. Uh, so the message that I sent to you all was just to make sure that you chose one representative to share um, your ideas. And so um, let's see, volunteers, any volunteers? Who wants to go first? I can go first. <laughs> All right. So my group was with uh, Ye Ping and Joanna. So we had one ideas was, well, talking about like lectures, right? I mean, we all need to do lectures. So how do you do that online? Well, with video and stuff. And uh, so Yuping was sharing how they had like a model ships to show like torque and things like that. So they just put it on the video to show with the model or using like a ruler to bend to show, uh, I think it's torque <laughs> or other pieces of things in their house to show bending and stretching and kind of explain how how their uh, those things work. <laughs> okay, so using props or household yeah, props. items props. around. Okay. Yeah. I feel that could even, sorry, can I just jump in? I feel that could even be turned into an activity for the students, right? Go find something in your house to demonstrate talk or whatever. I think oh, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a good idea. Send them on a little treasure hunt. Yeah. Yeah. Be be very careful what you choose. Don't don't break some priceless family heirloom. <laughs> right. Very good. I like that using props. It wasn't anything that I that I had thought of before. So very good. Thank you. All right. Who's next? I could, I could go. Um, I was with uh, Melanie, and uh, for me, or for us, it was probably a little a little bit easier because uh, we're talking about computing and uh -huh. um, uh, previously or a face-to-face -face, uh, teaching of computing uh, had moved it from a standard classroom or having a lectures and practical moved everything into the lab and that's been the way that it was running on the basis that it's a very practical uh, subject. Um, although I have not been teaching in this lockdown, uh, but one of the things that we have done within uh, my school was the implementation of uh, a system where every student will be logging in to a specific machine they are assigned machines in the physical laboratory, although they are, commit, they are connecting to it remotely. And we use software which allows the lecturer to be able to just, like we are sitting on the screen now, click on one and see what the student is doing. And that meant that when you are lecturing or you're telling students, okay, here, write a line of code and, uh, uh, is it working or do you have any problem? And you can actually click on a student's screen and see what they have written there. And you are able to correct the student. So that allowed uh, interactivity. Um, we did that for a few labs, but that is the sort of system that we are now looking to take forward even uh, after the pandemic. Um, so that keeps the students engaged, 
and ensure that it is not really passive learning, apart from you walk, physically walking around the classroom. Um, by doing that online, it means that the students cannot just log in, switch off their cameras and their microphone and wander uh, to the kitchen for a coffee or something. Um, yeah. And by looking at some of the activities where uh, it is not so easy for students to do that, uh, we haven't done it yet, but uh, we are looking at using what we call a single card uh, computer. They cost maybe just about a hundred pounds, which is you can give that to students and they will, they will have those at home. And uh, especially for programs such as cybersecurity, these are individual, individually linked into uh, the stacks uh, of equipment in the laboratories, which allow them to do more dangerous things than uh, would normally be allowed on public networks. So we are exploring that concept. And interestingly, our university has said from now henceforth, pandemic or no pandemic, no standard uh, lectures would be taking place. So anything you will do on campus has to be interactive wow. or you do it online. Wow, okay. All right, thank you for your share. Next group. We have two groups left. Mike, okay. Okay, so we were talking about um, sort of some uh, teaching room or classroom things that kind of go, go across cross subjects. Um, the first thing was was brainstorming, um, just just getting ideas from students to, to start off a discussion, and there are <clears throat> uh, tons of free tools out there to be able to do that. Um, I mean, Charity talked a lot about using Ding Talk. Um, I've seen it done with uh, WeChat, just a, a WeChat group for the class. And, and that's, that's, that just chugs along um, in parallel with, with the, 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 the teaching. <coughs> there are also websites like Quizlet and Padlet and Socrative. Um, I'm not sure how well they work. Um, outside or across the, the Great Firewall, but, but I've certainly used them uh, in the UK. Um, I also use a website myself called Nearpod, N-E-A-R-P-O-D, uh, which allows the students to have my PowerPoint slides on their phones right in front of them so they can see them uh, really clearly. Um, and they can also add in, you can, you can set it up so they have brainstorming activities as part of the slideshow. Um, uh, the other thing we talked about was, was group work and how group work can happen in a remote setting. And again, it's about using these tools like Ding Talk, setting up Ding Talk groups, setting up WeChat groups, um, or setting up groups in your university's VLE, if that's what, what the university sort of expects you to do. And just having short activities, move into group work, come back to short activities, move into group work, and, and just keep changing, keeping changing the focus. I think that's about thank it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, and last group with Lorianne and Lynn. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, um, yeah, we had a nice chat, um, Lynn and I. Um, many of the tools actually that Michael Michael used there, the Padlet and things like that, we use. I'm teaching English, so we're trying to make sure it's it's as communicative as possible the whole session. And and um, we're constantly sending the students to to breakout rooms to have discussion, group discussion, and then coming back. And um, one thing, I mean, compared to face to face teaching, I would always get the, get group to summarize their talk their their discussion afterwards and that's something I do but I get them to, to to often create a PowerPoint slide in their discussion um and then when they come back they share their screen and present their slide to the to the group uh, that just gives it a little bit more structure to it and, and I find and I think actually going back to face-to-face -to -face teaching that type of thing is actually 
a lot more difficult. Um, having to email the slides to your tutor or upload it with a with a memory stick. It seems all it seems like such a faff now. I think we've got so used to screen sharing and the ability to just look at the students' work. They upload a little paragraph into the chat and we can comment on it immediately for everyone to see. We can't do that face to face. Now, it's only now I'm starting to think actually actually it's it's there's a lot it's going to be a lot harder going back now i'm used to it but at first I, yeah i did i did hate online at first but but yeah there's many strategies and things we're using um but but we can ding talk sounds really interesting i, I never get involved in social media and I, that's something i think we need to do um on our course but yeah thanks everyone all right thank you everyone for your input so there's, there's lots of ways that we can engage with our students um, and lots of ways where, you know, you don't have to do it on your own and they're free tools. Um, like, like I was telling Mike before, he was talking about Nearpod and how it might be his, his secret thing. Not anymore, Mike, I'm taking it. <laughs> I'm gonna go check it out and see. <laughs> but no, uh, Nearpod, Ding Talk, Quizlet. Um, the software that you were talking about with your university about being able to click on what you know a student square and see what they're writing and correct I mean that's and honestly I I feel like that's that's the future I don't think that this is just going away just when you know the pandemic ends and so how can we stay relevant and and agile teachers so that our our students can continue to have maybe a hybrid learning experience, whatever it is, we don't know, but as long as we're ready and prepared and we can um, have engagement practices that will keep our students in tune with what we're teaching and also kind of hungry for more, I think we'll be doing a great job. So thank you all for, for listening to this presentation. I appreciate your, your participation and thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Gamma. <laughs> I think this is a really great end of <laughs> end of session. Any questions for Dr. Camel before we wrap it up? Uh, David, is that a hand or is that a clap? <laughs> oh, that's a clap. <laughs> that's a clap. <laughs> they look too similar. <laughs> oh, okay, Dr. Dagua Lee. Uh... <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Campbell, for such a, <clears throat> you know, very uh, uh, inspirational talk. I think it uh, so shows how, how resourceful you are, <laughs> how you have been. I think uh, <clears throat> the way you responded to the challenge, particularly initially. Um, uh, I, I guess maybe just uh, two, two very quick questions. The first one is when you talk about this, uh, uh, are the students or whether were the students participating individually or as a class gathered in a in a place in a classroom uh, that's just for clarification probably uh, my my uh, second question is um, how you you said you 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 are able to check uh, their engagement from moment to moment uh, you know check their posts as you <laughs> as, as you phrased it uh, <clears throat> yeah just wondering how how you did that, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. So the first question is both. Um, the first semester, uh, it was all individual because they weren't in a group setting, they were in their homes. Um, they weren't on campus yet. So they were doing all of the, you know, all of the, uh, when I was using Edmodo and, um, and I was trying my best not to use WeChat, um, but when we were using Edmodo and the, the, the space that we had for students to communicate, it was all individual. They weren't in a group setting. Then when students came back to campus um, in the fall of 2020, they were in group settings. And that's what you saw in the Dean Talk uh, screen share that I, that I showed you the video of where I would ask a question and you know they would respond right away. Um, that was all in classroom setting together. The second question, how was I able to check for a pulse? Um, we, we have our, um, we had technology for it. So there was a camera, <laughs> camera that was showing the entire class. Um, and so I could see my students, I could see when, this is the funniest thing though, students, you know, they see a PPT on the screen, mm -hmm. not your face. And, you know, 
they don't know that you can see them and they're they're with their phones like this. And, you know, I send them a message saying, hey, I see you, pay attention. You know, and then, and then you slowly see them go like this. <laughs> like putting their <laughs> putting their phone down because you're saying I see you not paying attention um but we were able to see the students and um and then also too we had that um physical representation of a TA in the classroom and I know Lorianne was talking about how they didn't have that at the moment but I'm telling you having a TA was like uh, a game changer for us um that and 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 we had to set up um, Mike, what, what is it called? It's like uh, best practices with the TA in the very beginning of the semester. So that, yeah. you know, yeah, so you we, can- we did, we did a, quite a lot of training. We did training with the, with the teaching staff and we did training with the TAs as well. It was just about what the expectations should yeah. be. So, you know, if, if the, the teacher is teaching and, and a, a student asked the TA, what did he say in Chinese? Um, just, you know, what, what, how should the TA respond to that? And we, we did a lot of work on that. And I think it paid off because yeah. Reba Charity, they're absolutely invaluable. Um, yeah. I would, my beard would be grayer if it wasn't for those TA. And my, my hair would probably be all black if I didn't have a TA. Okay. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so serious. Um, but, but even having like keywords and things like that for the mm -hmm. TA, I know Lorian, that's something that you, you said you are trying to advocate for making sure that you had those, those, um, like, you know, those, I don't want to say rules, but what do we call them? SOP standards of procedure or something like for the TA in the very beginning. Um, and also communication because you're working with technology and sometimes technology will betray you. And so what do you do in that situation? And so, um, my TA would send me a message on Ding Talk or she would call me and say, teacher, I have to restart the computer. So, okay, what are the students doing right now? You know, have them to continue reading. And then when I get, when, you know, when you call me back, then we'll continue on with the lesson. So it was just, you know, it, it worked. The TA was just like an angel. Yes, there's a question. Thank you. Yes. Uh... Just a quick question. I think listening to your presentation was really inspiring and it did make me to think about uh, how we teach students and sometimes our own predisposition to what a class should be and what it shouldn't be. Now, uh, I think I did mention my view. From your perspective, after this pandemic, the the emergence of technology and how, and using the experience we have now, how do you see that changing our education system? Our educational system or yeah, China's and, educational yes. system? Yes, and also you, you did mention about your experience of doing degree online. Uh, how do you see that sort of delivery now going forward? Honestly, I just, I, are you trying to get me in trouble with the government? This is Zoom, right? Okay, this is Zoom. I'm just trying, trying to make sure. Um, honestly, I think, I really just think it depends on, um, I think it depends on the, the country. Um, and the reason why I say that is because once all of this is over, now China has no shortage whatsoever of technological developments for education. You see um, training schools have been using online learning. It's just in higher education. And it has a lot to do with culture. If you want to preserve the culture and you want to be in the classroom, you know, it could take a few years before this becomes something that's normal in this country. But coming from my country a couple of years ago, we were already having, you know, higher education um, institutions that were coming up and they were accredited. And so I think it just, I don't know, it, I, I, to me, I think it depends on uh, the location, but I do see that it is something that China would be ready for because they have the technology for it. Um, definitely have the technology for it. It's just getting ahead of a pandemic would have been really, really great. I mean, so my university, they have, they had a virtual um, learning 
platforms called Baigua that I think many other universities, Chinese universities use as well. But the thing is, the foreigners, the Westerners, we, we didn't know how to use it. We didn't know anything about it. And then we had training, which it was in Chinese and, uh, and screenshots, which was in Chinese as well. So, I mean, it's, you know, you just have to kind of, I think this, this has had an effect and an impact. And I, I just really, however it progresses and moves forward, I, I think it's the higher ups that will really decide about that. I don't know. I could be wrong, but someone else wants to join in things that they say, but that's just my take on it. Mike? The, 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 the impression that I'm getting, and this is very impressionistic and very anecdotal, and I'm, I'm claiming no authority here, is that when I'm talking to people in British universities, EAP people, um, and just chewing the fat, they're talking about, you know, we might keep our, our pre-sessional courses, courses partially online after this, go, after this finishes. And, and this is going to affect the way that we, we teach in the long term. The, the mood music I'm getting from, from the Chinese university is we want to get back to normal as soon as we can. Um, and I, I mean, I, I'm not saying which, I don't have a, a view of which of those is, 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 is right or wrong or whatever, but it's, it's just it's, the, the, the Chinese seem to want to get to, to re-establish their, their pre-pandemic practices. Yeah. But the British universities are thinking more along the lines of, of long-term changes because of this. I think it's possibly because the British universities will want to sell their buildings off, turn them into apartment buildings. Thank you for your question. Melanie, how are we doing on time? Melanie is like the best timekeeper ever. <laughs> that, is, that is the one thing I'm good at. We have three minutes left. Um, so, I mean, one thing that I, I, having said that, I also have a question um, or maybe more of a comment. I think, I think one thing that really came out of, of this for me today is how labor intensive it is, the whole online teaching. And I think a lot of people have been under the impression that it will be less labor intensive, or at least like once the lectures are recorded, you could just play them every year. And that is just not, that is just not going to be it. So I think, um, what, what we have to think about very carefully if we want to keep that model, and I think it's, it's a good model to keep at least in parts, is, is what is involved in terms, of, in terms of just human power and labor and, um, and staff development as well. Absolutely, absolutely. That was one of the things that, um, you know, my, uh, some of my colleagues and I, we were talking like the beginning of the semester of last year, we were saying, oh, this is gonna be, this is gonna be great teach online this is gonna be fine you know we, and we're here we're visiting our family and then we realized a few weeks into it this is absolutely exhausting like you because you have to you you really do overcompensate for your absence for your physical absence and you have to make sure that students can grasp you know just physically being in front of a person a student um they're able to depending on how fast you speak or how slow you can make sure that their comprehension is secure, is stable. But suppose you are, you know, you're in a place where a students' internet connection is not that strong and they're not in a classroom setting and you freeze on the screen. That's frustrating for them and for you because now, you know, now you have to troubleshoot. I mean, there's so many factors that we haven't taken into consideration, but yes, it is more labor intensive. Um, but one of the rewards is you can do it from anywhere in the world, possibly. So. Excellent. Maybe this is an excellent note to end on. Oh, sorry, Dagwa. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just, just a very quick comment on, on that uh, same uh, thing. I think I, um, when I heard from Doc Campbell that you know, this idea of compensating for your uh, absence face to face, I think just think about it. Uh, we don't have to travel now. I mean, the days you spend traveling. Uh, and to recover from jet lags, for example, <laughs> you know, that that those that is also time saved. Yeah, uh, although it's very intensive, exhausting to prepare online. I think probably we could take some comfort, uh, you know, <laughs> from the fact that we we won't need the traveling, uh, we won't need to travel, and so that that could be uh, 
you know, worth thing to bear in mind, I think. I think the other thing, most serious one is actually, uh, you know, what, what do the, the student perspective, yeah? I think from our the feedback we got uh, over the, uh, you know, the past year and the last term, um, was that students really want to, you know, to meet with the uh, lecturers face to face? Yeah, I mean that's their, you know, what, what their desire is. Uh, so we have to bear that in mind as well, to the student uh, perspective. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. You're yeah. I think there still is something about physical presence that's that's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's what, what, interaction, I think, is not, not passive learning. Didact, didactic uh, learning, I think that's, uh, that's what would make it a bit more boring and bringing students with a specific purpose where they are actively learning rather than sitting and listening to the lecture. I think that's, that's the direction in which uh, we may go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Campbell. <laughs> and I guess we are at the time. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming and for our wonderful speakers today and for the rest of the, the talks previous. And this to Christine very... for, the, for, all the, for all the work you've done and bringing us together, I think it has been a very useful series so thank you i'm glad <laughs> I think thank you just saying also we are working on putting all the recordings online so they should be online in a few days yes thank you. So, watch out for that okay you thank you very much peruse yeah. it at your <laughs> yeah. exactly. thank you to the so thank you again. today and thank you particularly to christine and the melanie i think for your excellent organization i participated from uh, start to finish yeah uh, the yes. whole series kind of cool. <laughs> now we can uh, yeah we, we probably can get a medal for that but uh, i think you deserve, <laughs> you deserve a medal, uh, medal sorry <laughs> for your excellent organization and uh, you know uh, bring together all these excellent colleagues who have uh, done such uh, excellent work, not just to doing it, but also to reflecting and sharing the experiences. It's a great job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all for showing up <laughs> and for presenting. It's been really, really awesome. And maybe, maybe see you guys next year then. <laughs> and hopefully in person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all then. Bye. See you next time. Bye. Take care. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.